that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I need to do. Is Thank you for coming. Today is International Women's Day. Did you all know that? <laughs> on behalf of the Kennedy School of Government and the Women in Public Policy Program and the Institute of Politics, we are glad that you're here. Tonight, we're going to discuss the politics of abortion. And we are very fortunate to have a mix of advocates and decision makers. In one of America's most difficult and divisive public policy debates of our time. We have a former pro-choice congressman with a pro -life, from a pro-life state, a former pro-life congressman from a pro-choice party, and advocates from both sides of this contentious issue. And we are sure that you're going to learn a lot from this evening, particularly those of you who are thinking about running for elected office. How many? Let's see. Two. All right. Get them up, get them up, get them up. <laughs> and those of you who intend to be lobbying those who are <laughs> running for office. Um, you can see from this handout, did everyone get this handout? That this issue is as old as the hills. Ancient Greece and Rome, abortion was an acceptable way to terminate a pregnancy. And the first moral objections came from early Christians. Now, four years ago, we had a debate here in the forum, and your good predecessor, Al Simpson, reminded the audience what the forum is for and what its objectives are. He said, we are about raising consciousness not raising Cain. We are about listening, learning, and respecting each other's views. And so I hope that you will carry on that tradition this evening. Particularly, I want to th thank the student groups who have shown up this evening and shown their interest, the Harvard Right to Life, Harvard Students for Choice, Harvard Republican Club, Harvard College Democrats, Kennedy School's Pro-Life Student Caucus, Radcliffe Union of Students, and Kennedy School's Women's Leadership, Women's Leaders Circle. Our format is going to be very brief introductions by me, and then we're going to have a conversation here. Let me introduce you first to Dan Glickman, whom many of you know and love already. Our former pro-choice congressman from a pro-life state, is currently the director of Harvard's Institute of Politics. He was the US Secretary of Agriculture from 95 to 2001, and a member of the House of Representatives from 77 to 95. Graduate of University of Michigan, law degree, George Washington University. As a Democrat representing the 4th District in Kansas, he often had to deal with passionate constituents that disagreed with him on abortion, and we will ask him how he balanced his personal opinion with those of his constituents. Then, Romano Mazzoli, our former pro-life congressman from the pro-choice Democratic Party, is one of the most beloved members of the Kennedy School community. Do you know? Thank yes. You. He is the oldest student the Kennedy School has ever had. Go! Go for it! Go! For hey, it. Hey, hey. Go. He has had so, he had so much fun being an IOP fellow here that he came back and is now a mid-career. Mid-career. Got it? <laughs> all of you live on to 140 years old, so enjoy it. <laughs> Ron served as Kentucky's third congressional district in the House of Representatives. 1971 to 1995. He graduated cum laude from Notre Dame, Notre Dame, 
And he was number one in his class from Louisville University School of Law. As a congressman, he was known equally for his opposition to President Nixon's Vietnam policy, as well as his opposition to abortion. And it will be fascinating to hear you talk about how you balanced your personal views with those of the party. Thank you, Honorable Romano Mazzoli. Thank you. Kate, you know, this happened, this whole event is happening because Kate called. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, I've been at NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, for almost 19 years, and Kate is stepping down. And as we were chatting, we said, let's please have you come to campus and be here with students. Before NARAL, she was a specialist in early childhood development with a particular in, um, emphasis on developmentally disabled children. Ms. Michaelman became concerned about reproductive freedom after her own humiliating experience with a pre-Roe v. Wade abortion in 1970, which required her to obtain the consent of the husband who had deserted their family, as well as a hospital panel comprised entirely of men. She has three daughters and five grandchildren. Thank you, Kate, for being here. I have one grandson. I'm a University of Michigan graduate. I am. And Carol, a special thanks to you for coming up from DC as well. Our pro-life advocate is currently political director of the National Right to Life Committee, position she's held since 1991. Before joining the National Right to Life Committee, she was the executive director of the North Dakota Right to Life from 85 to 91. She organizes and conducts seminars on pro-life issues and participates in candidate training seminars, teaching candidates how to handle pro-life issues in a campaign. Carol is a frequent guest on TV news programs. She's appeared on ABC World News Tonight, NBC's Today shows, CNN, C-SPAN, and the Fox News Channel. Thank you, Carol, for being with us. Okay. Well, I will mention also that uh, Ron has to leave to, to be with an ailing family member, so right before the Q&A, he will be slipping off the, the stage. So thank you very, very much in particular for being here. Thank and may you. we begin with you and Dan just commenting about what it was like for you all as congressmen and dealing with your constituents, dealing with your party well, over this issue. Well, let me first say that Dan Glickman happens to be one of my closest friends and greatest former colleagues. Uh, he and I sat side by side in the Judiciary Committee for more years than either one of us will admit, uh, and we had fun doing it. So uh, in, in our case, we had a disagreement, but only as an issue, not in any way personal. But to get to what you said, Ambassador, and I thought you framed the issue well, uh, abortion is vexing, it's nettlesome, it's difficult, it's awkward, no one feels comfortable with it, but you have to deal with it. Public policy people, many of my classmates, and I see some in the room, will be wrestling with these issues in the U.S. and in foreign countries for uh, many years to come. How I handled it uh, back home, because um, I was from the start pro-life, if you want to call it that, um, was to handle it honestly, which is to say be honest with myself. Uh, it's my view, whether it's correct or not, history will write. I won't, but it was my view and I held to it. Uh, honest with my constituents, I didn't tell them one story one day and another story another day. It, it was what I was and I went home and had town hall meetings frequently and was asked questions about it and would try to relate the reasons why I did what I did. And, and honesty to my colleagues like Dan, uh, so that there was no finger pointing, no reproaching, no hair shirting, none of that. Um, because each person had a, a belief and they followed it. And I think in the last analysis, Ambassador, what um, I gleaned from my experience was uh, being a, a pro-life person in a basically a pro-choice national party was uh, very much like, uh, some of you might remember Kermit the, the Frog, that it ain't easy being green. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to be green though, uh, in effect be different in order to fulfill your own 
uh, personal uh, beliefs of yourself and of what's good for public policy. So uh, that, I think that would sum it up. A very difficult issue, uh, one that I chose from the start to be honest with my people about and tell them directly what I felt and would have discussions about it. And in the last analysis, accepting the fact, though it was very difficult, that pro-life is more than just simply being anti-abortion. It is to be for jobs issues and health issues and prenatal and postnatal and many of the things that I believe, like Cardinal Bernadine said, have life woven through them. And uh, I tried to uh, hold that for the 24 years I was in the House, and I hope I did. Mm -hmm. Dan, how does that strike you? Well, first of all, nobody had more integrity than Ron Mazzoli, and we were both from states that started with K, and they were the only two states that started with K, so we had this kind of <laughs> bond with us. And we, about 98% of the time, we voted the same exactly way anyway. Right. <laughs> and even when we didn't, it was always one of love. And it's an example of two guys who had different views on an issue, but we were never personal, and how different the Congress has become on so many issues where the division is just stark and mean. And there is no way to cross that line and do so happily and pleasantly. And I'm not talking about on issues, I'm talking about relationships. So this was in an era where there were tough issues, but um, I think Ron and I respected each other for that. I came into Congress in 76. I was a pro-choice member of Congress, but one of the things you find out in Congress very quickly as any elected official is you always want to be loved. You know, you want, you want your constituents to like you and, and vote for you. And, uh, this was an issue that you quickly found you have some people who will never love you on this issue, no matter how you try. And the more you try to get them to love you, the more they won't love you because uh, you're not as true to your own views sometimes. And so H.L. Uh, Mencken once said, for every complicated problem, which this is, there is a simple and a wrong solution. And I was from that viewpoint almost everything I dealt with. This is a complicated problem. It wasn't cut and dried. It wasn't easy. I saw both sides of the issue on so many cases. I wasn't, like Ron, I wasn't a, a, a zealous advocate of the issue, but I felt strongly in the right to choose, and, and it was, it was, that belonged to the woman. And, uh, but it became more and more a political problem because while the intensity of the issue was very strong, what I found the longer I was in Congress, particularly in the state I was from, the greater intensity was on the pro-life side. And the numbers were on that side. The volume, both in terms of sound and in terms of numbers, were on that side. This is how I saw the issue. Again, I could be wrong, but it's how I as a politician saw the issue. So it became more and more of a problem for me politically the longer that I was in Congress. Second thing that happened is that my hometown was the first place where they had Operation Rescues. It was in Wichita, Kansas, the first one. So that brought tens of thousands of people to Wichita to protest a doctor who performed third-term abortions in my hometown. And his name was Dr. Tiller, and, 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 and I say this uh, because I know the man and I liked him very much, but there were signs all over the community uh, where, go protest Tiller the killer. And uh, it became a big issue, and it was, uh, there, was, uh, there were, there were uh, lots of national media involved, and it created an opportunity for a significant amount of political organizing in my community. And so I'd go out to rallies, and I'd see people I had never seen before, people who'd never been politically active before, were suddenly out there saying, I should be defeated. I never saw these people before. Who are they? Where are they from? I mean, are they, are they even from my community? Well, they were. And, and uh, so the volume was loud, the intensity was extremely high. And that uh, uh, community became very much intertwined, although not completely, very much intertwined with the Republican Party. Uh, and in the state of Kansas, we were not a state known for long democratic traditions anyway. And so um, it, it provided an organizing tool for the Republican Party to get this large group of people to basically come over to their side. And it was a growing group of people. Frankly, most Americans are somewhere in the middle on this issue. They don't like abortion, but they're of mixed views on what the government should do to, to stop it. And, and uh, most people kind of want it out of sight, out of mind. But the people on the edges felt either very strongly for it or very strongly against it. 
And what I found in my community is those people on the edge who are very strongly against it were growing much faster and were much more effective than the people on the other side of the picture. And it just continued to grow and grow. And it became part of the organizing tool the Republican Party did to bring in a whole new generation of voters who had not participated in the American political process before. And ultimately, it was one of the factors that defeated me. It wasn't the only factor. But uh, because there were other issues, I'd served a long time, and there were, there were, there were guns were another big issue. And I just, I'm talking too long, but I mentioned one thing. I found that a lot of these issues began to play with each other. For example, the anti-gun movement in, in, uh, in political terms joined with the pro-life movement, even though they were separate issues. And you had a lot of the same people organizing in that kind of community. So it created an opportunity for organization. And I must say it was used very effectively against me. I mean, I, the, 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 the tools and the ability to influence the American political process was terrific. And, was, and, and, and I think it has, that organizing has in large stead been one of the reasons why the Republicans have been able to maintain their majority position in the Congress since 1974. So uh, in, in my case, I thought they defeated a very good, moderate, <laughs> balanced <laughs> member of Congress. Uh, uh, and and I, I ended up uh, finding another very good and probably better job out of the situation anyway. But it, but, but it was an extremely significant factor in the, and when I lost my election. Well, Ron, does that fit the way you saw things evolving in Congress too? And, I'll, and if it does, how did it yeah. feel for you to, to be, yeah. like, were you co consorting with the enemy or something? Well, it's a very interesting question, and I agree with Dan that times have changed, and I wouldn't say that Looking backwards, uh, uh, Bill Malden, the famous Second World War uh, cartoonist, was also an essayist, and he once in an essay said that, beware of looking uh, through the rosy glow of retrospect. So looking backwards makes things look a little bit better than they truly were. But I think Dan and I came to Congress in the 70s and 80s in, in a time when you did have uh, moments when you could visit with your friends and, and have relationships across the aisle, which are very difficult now. Uh, as far as the passion on the issue, there's passion. Uh, there was very big passion. Uh, there were many friends of mine, I mean, not huge tons of them, but many who came to me and said, well, we like you, Ron. We've uh, known you for a long time. You've been one of us for a long time, but you're wrong in this issue. And from this point on, uh, we're going to be opposing you. So as I said earlier, I tried not to finger point to them either because it's a free country. I tried my best to convince them that this was one issue that was a very, very powerful issue, a, a, certainly a dominant issue in some cases, but that there are other issues that ought to be put into the equation. Uh, but it's, again, a free country, and you don't have to put those into the equation. Um, what, I, what I think I did, uh, Ambassador, and, and maybe what, was, what allowed me to serve for 24 years in a party in which there is a litmus test, which is abortion, which says that I, Ron Mazzoli, Romano Mazzoli, could never have been president of the United States as a Democrat because I could never get the nomination. And that's a daunting thing. I mean, asking people to come into the Democratic Party as young people and saying it's a great party, the party of FDR, the party of JFK, wonderful people. Um, some of the same John F. Kennedy senior Democrats are now uh, Republicans, not just because of abortion, but because of the way sometimes people have handled the issue. And so I think I'd, I'd sum up by saying that while I have certain recollections that Dan has had of public meetings and of rallies and of sort of threats leveled back and forth, um, what I tried to do always was to be unequivocal on my stand. I didn't try to shade the words or be nuanced because that just simply tries you're trying to maneuver the thing. I just um, said this was my position, this is my view. Uh, it could be challenged legally, morally. Um, I don't suggest that you're not good if you're against this view. But this was what my view was from the start and what it was through to the end. And uh, trying as I did, uh, as Dan did, to, to say that there are many issues that have a life theme that are not involved in the abortion debate. And I tried to, in those life issues that were not directly in the abortion debate, I tried to be active in, those, in that debate and uh, represent my people in those issues. So um, my people returned me to office 12 times and um, uh, 
sometimes uh, people may have voted for me, uh, you know, holding their nose. Sometimes they may have voted for me opening their arms. But um, I think it was because I, I tried to be straightforward and fair with them every step of uh, my journey. I just uh, uh, well, I add one more thing. So many issues in public policy, you try to reach a middle ground. I mean, a tax policy, budget policy, environmental policy. You think about it. This was an issue which was almost impossible to reach a middle ground. Now, the, con the irony is most Americans are in the middle ground on this issue. But, but, but uh, quite frankly, what's happened is, is that the policy positions have, in large part, been driven, and for legitimate political reasons, They've been driven by people who have not been very interested in reaching the middle ground because the feeling is once you try to move to the middle, then you will give up a lot of what you've got and you'll end up being three quarters of the other side over. I mean, there was a, um, uh, a Congress, a former sec a state secretary of agriculture in Texas who once said the only thing that's down the middle of the road is a yellow stripe and a dead armadillo. And, you know, under the theory that being in the middle is not good. But it, the irony is in most policy areas on this issue, on, on these issues, being a kind of a, trying to be thoughtful and work through the issue is what you try to do in a, an American political system. This was one that is almost impossible to get down that road. And that's something I think both Ron and I had to deal with as moderates on most issues. Quite, quite true. Well, one of the ways you all were informed about what was going on uh, on this issue was through the advocates like Carol and like Kate. And I wonder what's going on in your minds as you hear these congressmen. I don't know how often you're, <laughs> you, we have this mix for you, but what's going on, either of you, as you listen to these guys? I, I think it's interesting to hear from their point of view. Um, you know, I've been involved in the campaigns working for and against the candidates. Um, and did you work against me in 1994? <laughs> Tell the I truth. Did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we did support Ron in 92. Actually, <laughs> actually, you might have done Dan a favor by opposing him. He yeah. became Secretary of Agriculture and Director of the IOP. That's not bad day's work. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, um, I might jump in a bit. Um, first of all, let me say that both Ron and Dan are exempl were exemplary members of Congress. Um, great integrity, um, really fine people, not zealots, either one um, on, on either side. And, you know, I personally appreciate the Rons of the world who are not zealots, uh, who have fundamental positions but are also available to talk to, even though I knew we'd never move him, uh, he was not a zealot. And his mission was not to go at this fundamental right of women to choose. I mean, he voted the way he believed uh, he needed to, to have the integrity. And so I appreciate both of them very much. And Dan, being in a state that where pro-choice people are not, <laughs> active and as well organized as they need to be. It's hard, as he said. I would just comment a little bit, you know, this issue, if I had my druthers, would not be in the political realm at all. Um, it became a political issue, a very intense one, after the 73 Supreme Court decision that recognized a woman's right to choose as a, a right of privacy. It was a careful balancing of, of interests, by the way, just so we set the record here. Roe did not grant and recognize an unfettered right. It recognized a woman's right to decide whether or not to terminate a pregnancy in the earlier stages of pregnancy, the pre-viability stage when the fetus cannot live outside the woman. But in that post-viability stage, it said to states, you have a right to prohibit abortion in, in order to or in the interests of protecting potential life, and states do. 41 of them have laws that prohibit abortion in the post-viability stages. Those laws, though, have to have an exception to protect a woman's life if it's at risk or a woman's health. 90% of all abortions are done in the first trimester. 
Our goal as a nation, in my view, should be to make abortion less necessary, certainly not more difficult and certainly not dangerous. So uh, the issue became a political one after 73 when Bob Dole used it, the first politician ever to run for office, my state. used it in 1976 uh, to defeat a candidate who was winning um, uh, in his opponent, who was an OBGYN, a doctor, whom he discovered, Bob Dole did, performed abortions, and he went at that doctor in the last two weeks, 10 days to two weeks of his election, and dragged the numbers down for the doctor who didn't know quite how to respond. So it was the first time that abortion was used as a political weapon. The same year, um, Charles Pickering, who's now on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, in the dead of night, the president, I might add, put him on the court, um, um, moved the, introduced the Republican Party platform to overturn Roe v. Wade. And from that moment forward, the Republican Party made it a mission to undo the right to choose and the right to privacy of American women and have been at it ever since. It's been in the platform ever since, and it has become a political issue. And um, that has meant that pro-choice people who were rather complacent in the view that their right to choose after American women suffered and died in the back alleys or who were humiliated and degraded as I was, who was able to avoid a back alley abortion only by virtue of going through other humiliating processes. But um, American women and pro-choice people, after winning this right, that really saved the lives of women, protected their health, and contributed to our equality with men in the social life and political life of this nation, were really had to garner their, uh, their forces and um, begin to organize. And pro-choice people tend to be less zealous than anti-choice people. They don't get up every day and think about how to undo the right to choose. And I wish more of them would um, or, uh, protect the right to choose. I wish more of them would be a bit more committed. And I think when they feel threatened, they will rise to the occasion, as they have done throughout the 31, history, history, 31 years since Roe. But it, it's sad to me that it takes a threat for pro-choice people to express their values um, and, um, and vote pro-choice. Anti-choice people don't walk into a voting booth very often and vote anti-choice. Pro-choice people, believing that the right is safe, believing that it's not a political issue, believing that President Bush, for instance, really won't act on his commitment to undo the right. Well, I can vote for him, but you know he really won't do this. Uh, pro, some pro-choice people will do that, and consequently, uh, we do have problems now and again, as we do right now. I'll stop there. Yeah, Carol, please. Jump okay, in. no, I'd like to, I guess, just maybe add a little more. Um, Kate made it sound like the Supreme Court said that abortion couldn't be restricted in the, after the first trimester when she mentioned uh, 41 states now have laws, um, but the Supreme Court on the same day as Roe v. Wade came down, also issued Doe v. Bolton, and they defined what they meant when they said that a state cannot restrict abortion if it is necessary to protect the woman's health. And they defined health uh, virtually, with, uh, I mean, a very broad definition of uh, mental health, physical health, emotional health, social health. Uh, there's really no reason that you would seek an abortion that wouldn't fit into the health definition. Uh, the states were able to pass legislation putting some limits on abortion, saying things like um, you have to have two doctors present if the child has um, passed the stage of viability. Uh, the abortion would have to be performed in a hospital where there would be um, extra medical help if necessary rather than just in an abortion facility. Uh, but abortions are performed um, pretty much through all nine months of pregnancy. Uh, now, as she said, most of them are done in the first three months, that is correct, but they are uh, legal throughout uh, the stages of pregnancy. Uh, there are laws being passed by the legislatures uh, saying that women should be told what's going to happen to them and to their unborn child uh, before they get the abortion procedure. 
Uh, there are some states that are looking at laws saying that if the child, the unborn child has reached the stage of viability, then anesthesia should be provided uh, before the abortion is per performed because that unborn child can feel pain. Uh, so there are laws that are you know, being considered. Many states have passed laws. Parents need to be notified uh, in many states before their minor daughter gets an abortion. Um, they have to give permission if she's going to get an aspirin at, you know, at the school. So you know, we think it's only reasonable that they should also know if their daughter is going to get this medical procedure. Um, but all those laws are coming about because the legislators that are passing these laws have been elected by the people. Um, Pro-lifers are very concerned about what's happening to unborn children in this country. 1.3 million abortions are performed every year. And I think it's wonderful that regardless of circumstances, there are people in this country who will walk into a voting booth and say, you know, even if um, I'm concerned about what's happening to my family, I'm more concerned about the babies that are being killed and they are willing to vote for legislators and members of Congress who will protect those unborn children. And, and I just think that's absolutely wonderful that we have that kind of commitment in this country. Now, Carol, <laughs> as you've talked to members of Congress, have you ever had the feeling that you've moved someone, that they've changed their vote from hearing your eloquence? I think we have been able to convince members to change their votes by getting them accurate information. We have seen, like on the partial birth abortion bill in the Senate in 1995 was the first time that bill came up for a vote. And we had, um, I'll check my notes here to make sure I'm right, uh, 54 votes of senators that voted for that bill. Uh, when we voted on it last year, there were 64 senators that voted for that bill. Now some of that is a change in just new senators who have come to the Senate but there were some members who changed their vote. And I think it's because we were able to give them the information uh, that at first when the issue came up, they were being told that partial birth abortions were being performed in very rare circumstances for severe acute medical problems. Uh, and then as we find out that many of them are being performed on healthy babies of healthy mothers, uh, thousands every year, some of the senators I believe, um, and some members of House just as I said, started getting more information and, and switched their vote. So I, I think that does happen. Ron, I'm going to ask you, because mm -hmm. you are going to slip out soon, I'm going to ask you, as you've listened to these conversations here, what's going on in your head, besides the fact that you're glad you're not in the, in well, the I, Congress <laughs> anymore? That may be the case. Uh, what's going on is, is recollecting conversations I had with Kate. I haven't really had conversations because I left office uh, prior to Carol coming in, but uh, uh, recalling those conversations and also conversations at home with people on either side of the issue and trying to make sure that I was always informed. In other words, I said I had a view and, and the, the view was one that I would express unambiguously and without any shading. But at the same time, I wanted to be honest with myself in using that term that I did earlier this evening and make sure that I was fully informed so that it was on not just this issue, but many of them where I would always be willing to talk to people and say, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something that has come up. Maybe there's been some new study that has revealed that what we believe were the premises of this program are not there anymore or that some other foundation comes in. So um, what, what I'm... What, what I've observed in tonight and what I was recalling in that observation is how much people like Dan and me um, have, have to, um, to, to be constantly alert, not to let things happen and not be aware of them, to be constantly informing ourselves of exactly where we are on these issues. And um, in my case, uh, with all the information and with all of the discussions, uh, I always felt that the position I had felt com most comfortable with always was uh, being uh, pro-life. Now, there were times when issues were brought up, rape and abortion, uh, rape and incest, and different things of that nature, and, and health of the mother, and there are some very, very poignant um, cases which have been documented. And, and in those cases, you're, you're riven by your feelings, but in the last analysis, if, if the principle of protecting innocent life is a principle, if, if it really is one, then it has to be applied 
not uncaringly and not unfeelingly and not without compassion, but should be applied pretty well across the board. And, um, and I felt that the innocent life here needed to be protected and that there were programs that I always supported, sometimes pro-life people don't, but uh, I certainly did, uh, that would support the women and support the families and not, again, uh, degrade them or, or disparage them in any way. And so I, I tried always to be in favor of programs like that, but always alert to what was going on in the field. And Dan, you want to add? It, it's interesting how this issue initially evolved. Most of the votes on Capitol Hill were on the, it was on the issue of federal funding for right. abortions. Right. And so it was, well, should the government pay for abortions in those circumstances where, let's say, women couldn't afford to do them, them uh, to pay for it themselves? And, and a congressman named Hyde from Illinois was very much involved in this. And, um, and for years, you know, the Hyde Amendment meant that you could pay for only federal funding for abortion where the woman's life was in danger. But in, 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 at some periods of time, that was expanded to rape and incest as well. And then, in my feeling, it needed to include health of the mother as well. But that was a difference between the pro-life and mm -hmm. pro-choice community. But what, what got me in this issue is, is that there was very little actual room to compromise because, for example, I think that the issue of parental consent is a legitimate issue that ought to be discussed in the legislative chambers. But I always felt that the real agenda of some in the pro-life community, not all, but some, was the repeal of Roe versus Wade and going back to where we were 50 years ago. And what worried me about that is, is that to remedy that problem under those circumstances, you'd almost have to criminalize abortion, which meant not only the doctor, but the woman would be subject to criminal penalties. And I said, hey, wait a second, I, you know, I can't go for that. That's way too far for me and for where I thought most Americans were. On the other hand, I think that most Americans have some concerns about the issue of partial birth abortion and some concerns about the issue of consent. Uh, I think that there's you know, some legitimacy there. And what we need to try to be doing as a country is to kind of sit down and have what I call genuine, unbiased dialogue on these kinds of issues. But it's, it's very difficult to do it because if you go down that road, if you're in the middle midst of politics today, you're in danger of losing your base who wants a very strong position on one side or the other. And, and, I, and I personally believe, from my perspective, the base on the anti-choice pro-life side is much stronger in this debate, and it's been much stronger in the debate than the other side. Now, if we were truly in danger of losing Roe versus Wade, my guess is the pro-choice side would certainly get much more vigorous because the, the fear of actually, well, okay, I'm just saying, I'm just, right. uh, you know. Right. I'm just talking about, from my no perspective, okay, I may be out, that's right, it may be 10 years and I may not know what's happening in the world at all, but, but, I, but I, I suspect that I'm probably more right than wrong on my observations. Of well, the in 92, uh, the, uh, let's go back a bit, in 1989, the court issued a decision, in, um, the Supreme Court, in the Webster case out of Missouri, and it announced it was going to overturn Roe. It said, we await the fifth justice, and Justice Blackmun, have you been hearing about Justice Blackmun's papers and writings. I mean, it wasn't just the pro-choice movement that was, you know, telling people that we are close to losing that right. Justice Blackmun actually saw the loss of the right. And it was by sheer change of Justice Kennedy's view that gave the four to five protection or reaffirmation, re uh, of, of Roe versus Wade, um, although a more limited right in 1992. However, pro-choice people, after the 89 decision in the Webster case, literally sat, were shocked to realize that the court was moving toward taking away their right to privacy and freedom of choice, and mobilized across this country like it hadn't almost since 73 or prior to 73. Um, and as a result of that, President Bush, number one, was defeated. Had he not been defeated and had we not elected the first fully pro-choice president, 
we would be having a different conversation today. The court was one vote away. President Clinton named two justices to the Supreme Court. One is Justice Breyer, right from your own home here. Um, and had President Bush been reelected, those nominees would have been quite different. Would have been a struggle, but he would have po probably gotten through, uh, even under a democratically controlled Senate, as Clarence Thomas is noted to have done. Um, he would have gotten through that one vote and Roe would be lost now and there would not be a right to choose for American women. So we are confronted with the same reality, very similar reality. It is true the anti-choice movement wants to criminalize abortion. I do appreciate when I hear politicians talk about how we need to discuss these things. Well, for women, these are a fundamental life decisions. These these are life-shaping decisions. The idea of a legislative body sitting around discussing, and I've heard it in Pennsylvania, I heard the legislature, I was on the floor of the legislature, listening to them discuss the reproductive functions of, Amer of, of the women of Pennsylvania. In the, in, the, in, the anti, in the debate that just took place, a president who signed this bill called partial birth abortion, which is a political term, mind you, not a medical term, it's a political term. There is no such thing. Illegal. That bill is the first federal law ever to criminalize abortion. It puts doctors in jail for two years, up to two years. It doesn't just criminalize one procedure. It criminalizes many, beginning in the second trimester. It puts the legislative body of Congress in the position of deciding whether or not a particular procedure is the most appropriate for a woman. That is not the business of a legislative body, with all due respect. Um, and so, <laughs> hey, let me, I, I, do, I do actually feel bad that you have to decide these things because it's, you, you shouldn't have to. Women are capable of making these decisions and again, your job should be to address the conditions that cause three million women every year to face unintended pregnancy. That is something I think we could do something about. More family time. more voices. Let's bring some more voices into this conversation. We have See, microphones here, <laughs> here, <laughs> two up there, and we'll rotate around. As you Ambassador, oh, sorry, can, I, can I say one thing? What I'd like you to do, <laughs> what I'd like you to do is, as I, I'm sure you're very good at answering a question and then working it into a longer <laughs> I mean, we all four know how to, all five of us know, know how, how to do that, do that okay? That, right? um, and ask a question rather than making a speech, please. Identify yourself, and we'll begin right there. Yes, I thank won. you very, I very won. much, Ron. <laughs> My name is Nathan Rosenberg. I'm a junior at the college. Um, my question is, in dealing with congressmen and senators, do you ever find that um, the congressman decides to side with what the polls are saying about their district rather than what their personal feeling, or is this something that everybody seems to say, this is my view and you know, I'm going to stick to how I feel about this regardless of what the polling is saying? Carol, would you like to address that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you actually see both. There are some who aren't quite sure really what they want to do, or maybe they have some conflicted feelings, and they think, well, I know the people in my district, the majority of them, at least the ones I'm hearing from, are going to you know, believe one way or the other, and, and that does make a difference in how they vote. There are many also who, when you look at their voting record, um, you know that they're voting their personal position rather than the district that they represent. So it, it works both ways. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, I think that's true. I, I, I have found um, since 89, when we presented the issue as one of a question of who should make the decision, that more and more comfort seemed to 
uh, arise among Here. the pro-choice legislators who were having a struggle, I think, finding a voice. Because again, the issue really isn't whether abortion is right or wrong. That is one for each of us to decide personally. And many of us, many people who are pro-choice would not have an abortion. They just would not. But they don't believe that decision should be made by someone else, by the government for another person, for another woman. But many of these legislators um, voted because they thought the anti-choice movement was stronger. And they also thought that Roe versus Wade would always be there. In 89, I remember Frank Pallone stood up on the floor. He's a New Jersey congressman, stood up on the floor of the House. And he said, I'm changing. I'm, I'm, I can't be, vote against the right to choose anymore because I can't be making decisions for women. I, I, I realize now the Supreme Court may undo this right. So I think, I think it is a little of both. Can yes. I, can, well, yes. I, I need to, because I was one, so I, <laughs> I, I, I need to answer. Right. How many of you in this room feel intensely on the issue of abortion, one way or the other, <laughs> okay? How many of you in this room would vote on this basis largely is the reason why you would vote for, okay. See, here's the issue. If you're one of me and you're out there and the natural order of things in politics is to get reelected, it defies the laws of nature to think you run for office and you're gonna do exactly what you wanna do, come hell or high water, I don't care if I serve more than two years. That is, that it does not happen in this world. So just it doesn't happen. You might think it should happen. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen on most issues. And so therefore you have an issue that people feel very intensely about. And you know, I happen to agree with this woman right here. We went to college together, Kate we, and I. We just yeah. discovered yeah. we went okay. to the University yeah. of Michigan I, at the same time. I happen to agree, agree with her. It's really none of my business to muck around with these decisions, but it is a political decision and it's part of the process and we can't wish it away. It will not happen. So therefore, it, it is become a policy issue, and therefore we have to, as public officials, we have to deal with it in the political context, and we have right. to face the issues of intensity, and we want to get reelected. Uh, in my case, I wouldn't have had a marriage if I had voted the other way. My <laughs> wife would have left me, so that was more important than, than the other kind Good of thing. Wife. You know, but, you know, unless, unless you're a true believer, uh, and there are some in Congress who are, most people are pretty much trying to do the right, right thing. thing. They are. And they balance that with their own views versus the views of their constituency. And you can't do it any other way. And that's why the issue is so difficult. So just hoping that it'll go away and we have no business mucking around with it, that, that may be an interesting political theory, but it is not realistic and not consistent with the American political system. I just system. love listening to Dan Glickman talk about intensity. A year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Doreen Martinez, a Master in Public Policy School at the, here at the Kennedy, Master in Public Policy program here at the Kennedy School. And my question is for Kate and Carol. The title of this forum is The Politics of Abortion, so I'd want to hear a little bit more about the politics surrounding accessibility to abortion clinics, yeah. uh, physicians being trained to perform abortion, and maybe the regulations and restrictions surrounding abortion. Since 1995, States have enacted nearly 400 restrictions on a woman's right to choose. E each of these restrictions is designed to both increase the financial costs, um, humiliate women, intimidate them. Um, I mean, there, there are all kinds of different names for these restrictions. Clinics have been burdened um, and have to spend a lot more money to provide the service. Doctors have been harassed and intimidated, threatened, some murdered, um, and so there are fewer of them. Their families have been attacked. 90, uh, I'm sorry, nearly 90% of all counties in the U.S. have no provider at all, nearly 90%. Um, uh, you may think that's a good thing. I think it's absolutely disgraceful that a reproductive medical decision um, and choice and procedure that is, uh, you know, could save a woman's life, protect her health, and certainly make her able to be a successful parent is, um, is gone. But anyway, to your question, it is difficult. Poor women, rural women, young women, working class women, the least politically powerful women in the country have had their right to choose incrementally dismantled. 
Um, Kate, let me get, let's yeah, get sorry. to Carol, sure. Oh, so Thomas Jefferson said that the first and only legitimate object of good government is the protection of human life. We are passing laws in states around this country trying to do just that, protect the life of unborn children. There is absolutely no intent or purpose or goal to hurt or injure or humiliate women. Uh, you will not find in any legislation, at least none that I am aware of and certainly none that I would support, where a woman who is seeking an abortion is going to pe be penalized in any way. We are not out to hurt women. We do not want to hurt women. We want to protect the innocent life of another human being who is alive, who is growing, and we, who we believe has a, a deserves protection in this country. Could I give it? Could I give an example, though? Because yeah, yeah, really there's an example that I'm I. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that Carol right, knows how to do. Right. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kate, and I'm an MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is for Kate. Um, Given that the state of California is prosecuting Scott Peterson for the homicide of his unborn son, Conrad, and given that people are regularly held civilly liable for injuries they cause intentionally or accidentally to unborn children, why are these same lives not worthy of protection when it is a mother who chooses to abort or kill a child? Is this not a form of discrimination? I think a woman who is pregnant, who is the victim of or subject of violence that harms her pregnancy or causes the death of her pregnancy, um, suffers additional harm, greater harm, and the perpetrator of that violence should be held to a, a, a greater penalty. But that can be accomplished, and we, NARAL Pro-Choice America, um, believes that, uh, 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 supports the legislation in Congress today called the Motherhood Protection Act which would give enhanced penalties to any criminal that causes uh, the harm, as I said, or the death of a pregnancy. But it does so in a way that does not embroil this particular issue in the abortion debate. This should not be an issue of abortion. The right to choose whether or not to terminate a pregnancy has been recognized by the court as a right of women balanced, as I said earlier, with the state's right to prohibit abortion in the post-viability stage. The issue of a woman having harm done to her and her pregnancy uh, is a, an issue that can be addressed, as I said, successfully without undermining a woman's right to choose, without creating a, a, a dichotomy between a woman who, and, and her pregnancy. Uh, so that's our, that's, you know, and I think the Lacey, Kate, Lacey Peterson case has been, it's tragic, and it's been exploited to push a bill in Congress called the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, which would mm -hmm. for the first time on federal law recognize the fetus, the embryo, um, as a separate distinct person apart from the woman. That law is designed to create a legal pathway to overturning Roe. Yes. Uh, Reg of the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. Um, simple factual question. Assume that this um, um, constitutional amendment that would ban abortions um, event gets passed and becomes part of the Constitution. Who, who would be criminalized in that case? Uh, uh, only doctors providing the procedure, or would women who submit to the abortion procedure be criminalized should this amendment become part of the Constitution? There is, there is no law, as I said, that I am aware of that would, and, and certainly if a constitutional amendment is passed, the woman would not be penalized. That, that, that's not the goal. We want to protect the unborn children. We don't want to hurt women. Um, so. The doctor would very likely be the, the suspect in any, in any uh, abortion procedure that is performed. The woman would not be included. Thank you. Uh, let me just say that I don't think legal scholars are of no. unanimous view on that That's issue. Right. And I, I must say that it would be extremely um, worrisome if we would be uh, uh, sending a woman to the penitentiary because uh, she has had an abortion 
uh, and particularly uh, you can just imagine the immense consequences there would be to women under those circumstances. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I, I would lo hope that you're right, but I don't well, know whether the, the, the jury, the, I think the jury is out in terms of how it would be drafted. A constitutional amendment that would protect unborn children is not going to pass without the support of the pro-life community. I don't know of anybody in the pro-life community that is going to do anything that would include the woman. But so it, it's, it's not going to happen. But if the laws of the state as a result of the human life amendment make abortion murder and a woman is <laughs> engaged in terminating her pregnancy and that's considered murder, it, I know the anti-choice movement doesn't like to talk about the idea of a woman being subject to criminal penalties because it is horrifying to think because they know they lose ground when that image comes up of a woman going to jail or a woman being prosecuted for murder. But how does a law work? Um, a doctor is, it's obvious, but a woman is, a woman is, is terminating her pregnancy. So I think it is nice, as Dan said, it's not so simple and clear. Prior to Roe, there were cases of women who were prosecuted. Mostly the doctor was gone after, but I'm not, aware of, I'm not aware of any, there are any law prior to Roe that prosecuted the woman. There were some, though. Yes. Hi, uh, my name's Jiro Cavallo, computer science student. I want to say something fairly obvious, but nonetheless was motivated by Ms. Michaelman's earliest, earlier comments. So it seems like to me that any argument that's rooted in like a constitutionally derived freedom, when that's viewed in isolation is a non-starter because on the pro-choice side, it's the freedom to choose. On the pro-life side, it's the freedom to a life. So the, the question has to boil down to what you're gonna consider to be a life. And the, the Constitution doesn't really speak on this. So how else could we possibly decide except through our democratic institutions? You, this is motivated by your saying that the legislature isn't the right part for it the right place for this. But I mean, I think this is a question that people should pretty much decide. And it's one of the reasons I'm shocked to see that people are almost split completely across, uh, across party lines on this. Why is it that all Democrats, most Democrats would think that uh, a fetus is not alive and most Republicans would think it is? So I mean, it's, but anyway, my point is just that I think that the democratic institutions are the place to decide this issue. And I'm just surprised why you would dispute that. Thanks. Um, I don't disagree with you that, that the question of when life begins is an important question. And I think religions throughout history have debated this question, thought about it, talked about it, moralized on it. I think that's the proper forum. Uh, I don't think there's any, been any agreement over time the, you know, as to exactly when life begins or what constitutes full life. I know that women do not consider a pregnancy um, without value. I, in my case, uh, when I was struggling with whether or not to have an abortion, I had three children prior to that time. I knew that if I continued my pregnancy, I would have a child. I didn't need a sonogram or an ultrasound to tell me that. I had three children. The question for me was, was it the right and moral thing to bring a fully formed a child into this world. It wasn't, I decided. It would have been wrong because of my circumstances. I made a good decision. But the question of when life begins is one that we all have to struggle with. As far as legislative bodies, I do think there are issues that need to be worked out legislatively. But um, it is hard to sit and listen to a legislative body a lot of the men, most of the men, although they have a right to legislate. Why would men be any less qualified to decide when the, a human life begins than a woman? That just... No, when men can decide. Men can, men can decide for themselves when life begins. But they, I don't think men have a right to impose in law on all women their view of when life begins so that women have no ability to determine the course of their own physical and full life. I mean, that's the issue is who gets to decide over the lives of women? And so I think men have a right, absolutely have a right, and they have a right to weigh in. Um, but I think when it comes to controlling the, 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 the fundamental life functions of a human being, that human being should have the right to decide. Yes.
Hi, my name is Andrea Flynn. I'm an employee here at the Kennedy School, and my question is for the entire panel. Um, it's been proven in many cases that strong sexuality education and access to contraceptives is one of the best ways to prevent unwanted, unwanted pregnancies and therefore the number of abortions mm -hmm. that are needed. So I'm wondering if any of you could discuss the anti-choice movement support of abstinence-only education. We have no position. I'm speaking for the National Right to Life Committee. We have no position on uh, birth control, on contraceptives. Uh, there are a lot of people in this country who support it, a lot who oppose it. Carol, does they can, they can take, they can, I guess, do what they want. Where we see our interest coming into play is when you now have a new life, there's an unborn child there that needs to be protected, and that's when uh, we, we believe that the government does need to accept responsibility and do what it can to protect that life. Carol, is that position, um, does that include IUDs after conception occurs? We have a statement that says if you, I mean, you should talk to your doctor if he or she says that this type of what might be considered contraceptive is also an abortifacient and could take the life of the unborn child after that life has begun, then of course we're going to encourage you not to do it or to use it. But would you imagine an IUD? Well, we have, we have no position would, on contraceptives. You, would you imagine in a constitutional amendment uh, that an IUD would be included as being prohibited? Again, that's going to be, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, I, that's I just a didn't know yeah. in, in your community if, if you all had real clear positions on the IUD. Could I that's respond to the abstinence only education? I mean, it is true what you say, and it's a very important issue because, as I said earlier, I believe our nation's goal should be to make abortion less necessary. And one of the ways is through education. And that education should be comprehensive, age appropriate, developmentally appropriate. I, as a, as, as a developmental psychologist years ago, actually wrote a human development curriculum that I had planned would go from kindergarten all the way through. And it would slowly and progressively educate young people as to how they grow and what they experience and help them to understand themselves and others. So that by the time they become adolescents, um, they're ready for the information about their sexuality. Clearly, we want kids to be uh, teenagers and young people to be able to prevent sexually transmitted diseases, um, AIDS, HIV AIDS, as well as pregnancy. And, and while while there is a claim out there that educating about contraceptive availability and protecting against pregnancy encourages young people to have sex, it's not borne out. It's not borne out. Um, and in fact, the availability of contraceptives, education about them, and most recently, the availability of emergency contraception has really reduced pregnancy unintended pregnancy has reduced the number of abortions. I believe in abstinence only education. I'm a mother of three daughters. Can you imagine? Um, and I, I believe in it. I think it is a very important option. But I don't think any sex education program should be limited to abstinence only. It should be comprehensive. And there's a way to do it without, again, as I said, encouraging or promoting sex. You don't, you know, you wouldn't put, I know I wouldn't put my daughter in the car without driver's education uh, to drive a car. You had to teach them. You just don't send young people out into the big world of sexuality without having knowledge that will help them. So I think it's very important. I think there is a terrible movement in this country to get abstinence only. Some of those programs are horrific. They give bad information. Um, we've done, re NARAL Pro-Choice America has done research on some of them. Our tax dollars are going to support those programs. President Bush has made it a high priority. Not good. Let me, uh, yes. I, I'm, this is not an area that sentences. I'm particularly an expert in. Um, I, I support abstinence education. I just don't think it ought to be the exclusive thing. It doesn't, it's not the way the real world works. But I think there is some evidence that high school students are engaging in sexual activity less frequently than they did five years ago or 10 years right. ago. USA Today had a full page story on this today. So, you know, to the extent that uh, people think this is an appropriate way to go down, there's no reason why you shouldn't teach kids this aspect of it, but not to the exclusion of, of other educational endeavors. 
Bill, I'm gonna, Bill Floyd, I'm going to depart from tradition here. We're going to go around. I want to hear the, what your questions are, because I think this is really important. So we're, I'm going to, I want to hear five of your questions, and then I'm going to ask okay, each of good. you to do a last statement. OK. I'm Paul Schultz. I'm a senior at Harvard College, a member of Democrats for Life of America, and former president of the undergraduate Harvard Right to Life. And my question is mostly for Kate. Um, Dan has said, and it's obvious to those of us who watch the polls, that many Americans are in the middle on this issue. And I think this is especially because of the rhetoric of your side. Specifically, two years, one month, one day ago, you were at Harvard Law School talking on a similar topic. And when you finished your notes, you set them aside and you said, we are all here tonight. We know that an abortion ends a human life. What is important to us is whether or not it is a human person, and that is what we base our laws around. To what degree do you believe that the people that belong to the pro-choice movement believe the same thing, that it ends a human life, but that the human person is what is important? The, the grassroots members, the people that don't think about it a lot, do they think that a human life has ended? Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, I, Adam Kolosinski, I'm a, a doctoral student at Sloan down the street. I'm also vice president of MIT Pro-Life. Um, my question is uh, to, I guess, to the congressman, and I would have liked to ask the other congressman, but he's not here. You spoke a lot about uh, a middle ground and not finding a middle ground on this issue. But to me, it seems as if a middle ground is not logically tenable in this situation. I mean, if you think abortion is murder, for what reason would you possibly allow it? And if you think that abortion is not murder, for what possible reason would anyone have to restrict it? I mean, it's, it's, it's either one or the other. How can you possibly come up with something in the middle? Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Alon Gev. I'm a junior at the college. And uh, my question is also for the whole panel. I was wondering, we keep coming back to the issue of whether this is an appropriate topic for legislation. And to someone mentioned that the fundamental issue is whether this is a life or whether this is a person, however you want to phrase it. What sort of precedent is there for Congress making these legislative decisions about something that is fundamentally scientific? And given that our system of government is supposed to theoretically at least have a separation between church and state, and that religious arguments for when life begins shouldn't enter into the debate. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Kelly, MPP program. If you had a crystal Excuse ball. Excuse me, who are you? Uh, uh, MPP program, Kelly. If you, had a, if you had a crystal ball and could look far into the future, where do you see the future of this issue? Do you see uh, civil war emerging? Do you see uh, abortion to continue so. to remain legal, or do you see it being outlawed? OK, now you all, it's International Women's Day. We cannot end this with five guys asking questions. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Nancy Woolley, and I was an elderly graduate in 92 of the School of Law. Mostly, I identify myself as a mother of four by choice. Uh, I just have noticed some curiosities that I would like commented upon. Uh, number one, in many states, of course, it's legal for a 16-year-old to marry. In many states, it would be illegal for that same girl to have an abortion without informing her parents. And yet that same girl then is expected to take on the most horrendous job in the world, trust me. <laughs> uh, I find it curious that uh, the so-called pro-life uh, uh, advocates are not storming the legislatures uh, uh, to, uh, to get rid of legislatures who vote for the death penalty. That is certainly not life. So. I, also, I also find it curious that if, in fact, human personhood begins at the moment of conception and there's a miscarriage, where are all the funerals? All right, and we'll just right. stop yeah. there. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, in whatever order you all would like to make um, a final statement that capture some of the richness that you've heard just now. OK. Well, um, just on the last comment, I know there are women who do have funerals when they have miscarriages. They do take that, that life uh, very seriously. Um, one of the questions was, you know, where do you see the future? You know, what's in the crystal ball if we could look into it? Uh, I'm very optimistic. Um, 
because if you look at just about everything that's happening, I think things are on the side of the pro-life movement. When a young couple is pregnant, you know, pregnant and they're all excited because they're going to have a baby, the first picture they have of their baby is the ultrasound. You know, many years ago, it was the first baby, uh, first picture after delivery, and you saw the scrunched up, you know, little red face. Now it's the ultrasound, and grandparents have pictures of that ultrasound on their refrigerator. They're seeing pictures of their baby before birth. And I think that's, you know, medical technology, scientific technology is all going to be very helpful uh, to advancing our position that we're talking about another human being here. Uh, it's widely acknowledged that young people are more pro-life than pro-choice. Uh, the New York Times had a great article last summer talking about women who were in middle age, maybe they were still part of the baby boom generation, and they were you know, going to, uh, they're finding out that their daughters who are in high school and college and doing papers are now all of a sudden doing papers against abortion. And they're wondering, you know, what happened to my kids? You know, why are they pro-life when I, you know, I didn't raise them that way? Um, we see, you know, polling, UCLA has done uh, polls of college freshmen over the years, and those numbers are con constantly dropping. Um, Francis Kissling of uh, Catholics for, I'm sorry, Catholics for Free Choice, uh -huh. uh, it recently said that the pro-life movement is getting younger, the abortion rights movement is not. Thank you, Carol. Thank so you. I'm just, I'm encouraged. I think the future bodes well for the pro-life movement. And by the way, we had, we had friend Kissling here as well okay. earlier. Yes. Uh, which of you, Cater? Go ahead, Dan. All right, I'll let you close. And, and, and by the way, Kate has done a splendid job as head of NARAL, whether you agree or disagree <laughs> with the thing. You know, and, and you. You know, I'm, I'm reminded, this isn't exactly apropos, but years and years ago, there was a senator from Illinois named Everett McKinley Dirksen. Oh, yes. And he had this great deep voice. Mm. And he was a very, very conservative senator. And he tended to vote against everything that re required the expenditure of monies. <laughs> and, and, and one day, his colleague in the Senate, a man named Paul Douglas, who was a liberal Democratic senator, discovered that Senator Dirksen had put in over $100 million for a wa central Illinois water project that is actually has been created. And so Douglas went to Dirks and he says, Everett, I don't understand you. I thought you were a conservative. I thought you were a man of principle. <laughs> and Everett looked at him and smiled and says, I am a man of principle. And my first principle is flexibility. <laughs> what struck me about that is, is that it defies the human condition to be an absolutist, for most people to be an absolutist in this world. For example, the, the question was raised, well, is, it's either murder or it's not murder. But the Bible says thou shall not kill, but all theologians say there are exceptions to that. For example, self-defense, war, uh, and you know, a myriad of other kinds of exceptions. And that's what happened then, then both religion and then legislative bodies, which by the way, reflect religion very, very dramatically. Our laws very much are based upon all the great religions of this world, try to massage this process and try to come out with what is in the best interest of everybody using good judgment and good common sense. To do that sensibly requires some amicable discussion and requires some consensus building. And, and what is interesting about the issue that we talk about today is, is that in many quarters, for whatever reason, there is the belief that this subject does not fit within that model. For whatever reason, this subject is off limits in terms of trying to you know, sit down and try to work through it because people have very, very strong beliefs on it. And all I'm saying is, is that, that unless that happens, and I suspect it will not happen for a while, this subject will tend to be, continue to be very divisive in America. And I would add one point to uh, what you talked about. We've done our own polling here at Harvard and what you say is, actually, is absolutely true. We've done surveys nationally of college students nationwide, and it does show that in fact there is a, a perceptible, small but perceptible movement in the anti-choice direction on behalf of, of college students nationwide. So I would say a word to the wise and a word to the warning on the, the community that wants to keep this as a constitutional right. You've got a lot of work to be cut, done. There's a lot of stuff to be done. 
done or because the other side has really been, in terms of getting grassroots engagement in the American political system, they, they, they've been extremely effective in doing so. Now, Kate. Kate, we're going to let Yeah, we're. Let her, co let her close. We have, we've made it to the end, okay. and we I'm going to ask you to, to make your remarks in a couple of very tight paragraphs. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, tight paragraphs. Is that a criticism of? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you were intense. She's yeah. going to be tight. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for coming, first of all, and appreciate the opportunity. It is, um, uh, it is an issue that really does inspire a lot of debate. Um, I do believe the question of abortion does involve um, ethical, moral, philosophical issues and involves a lot of the questions that each of us has, and many of you have raised tonight. Uh, and I do think these are issues that are important to talk about. Uh, I do, however, remain uh, rooted in the belief that the person who should fundamentally answer those questions is the woman involved. Um, not that others shouldn't question and, and deliberate, but that in the final analysis, um, the question of who should decide, whether it should be women or government and politicians, for me is clear. It should be women in the end, who have to live with, um, who have to live with their decisions, um, make the best choices. I also think that as a nation, we would benefit by having a discussion about the morality of childbearing and parenting that is as intense and as strong as we have a discussion over 31 years about the morality of abortion. I do not... <laughs> there is no woman who faces a pregnancy who does not understand she has a developing life within her. Uh, that gentleman that spoke earlier, were you the gentleman that spoke earlier? I'm not sure I said human life, I may have. What I talk about is the fact that women know they have a developing life, and they know if they continue the pregnancy, they will give birth. But there are circumstances that women find themselves in when they are pregnant, when they do not plan to be, nor can be, and that it's more moral in their view to not bring a child into the world, to terminate that pregnancy early, and in fact, the very fact that the anti-choice movement has moved to make it harder for women to uh, have abortions means that they sometimes their pregnancies are later and longer than they should be because of the obstacles they need to overturn, uh, overcome. But in any case, women know they have, um, they have a developing life, um, but I think that bringing a child into the world is the most important moral responsibility we have. And, uh, we should get to decide when the circumstances are right and when they're not to do that. And on that note, let's thank our guests.